want to invite you to uh, join me as we praise our God now through the Word of God. And so please open your Bibles in the book of Acts. We are going to go now to the second volume of the same author that we studied last week. Last week we studied the book, the Gospel of Luke. And now we are going to move to the same writer now, but a different book, the, 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 the uh, book of Acts. We are going to go to chapter 16. So please open your Bibles in chapter 16. This is the book of Acts. And we are going to read just um, a good portion of, of the book just for us to have a good uh, context of what we are going to be studying today. You ready, friends? You want to be blessed? You know that the Word of God is designed for you to be blessed, but it's in, uh, uh, in your attitude, in the way you prepare for this. You have to tell to the Lord, the same one that inspired this book has the power and the willingness to inspire you today. So talk to him and tell him, Father, I want you to bless me today. I want you to talk to me today. Okay, so please open your Bibles in chapter 16 of the book of Acts. And we are going to start reading in verse 23. Which verse? Here we go. It says, And when they had laid many stripes on them, they, were threw, them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Listen to those words. Having received such a charge, he put them into the, what friends? Inner prison. And fastened their feet in, their, in the stocks. Now, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were in shaken and immediately all the doors were opening everyone's chains were loosed and the keepers of the and the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open supposing the prisoners have fled drew his sword drew what friends and was about to kill himself but Paul called with a loud voice saying do yourself no harm for we are all we are all here then he called for a light ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas and he brought them out and said sirs what must I do to be saved so they said believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his all and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set foot before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. Oh, dear friends, there is so much that can be said about this passage. But today we only have but a few minutes. So pray that the Lord will say to us what we need, what we need to hear today under the message entitled, God will save. Let's pray. Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we come before you. Because there is nothing that we can offer to you. There is not good deeds that we can bring as an offering. There is nothing good in us, Father. But we call upon you, our good Father. And we pray, Lord, that this morning our minds will be open, our hearts will be open, and our lives will be transformed. We pray all this through the Holy Spirit in the wonderful name and powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God will save. God will save. The week before, last week, we saw God will provide. Last week, God will protect. And this week, God will save. God will save. Acts, the book of Acts, as I was saying, is the second volume written by Luke. In this second vo volume, Luke is not only telling us what Jesus said but Jesus did and said but Luke is also recording what the, the church that was instituted the, the church that was started I have I have an echo 
the, the church that was started by Jesus himself started to do. And the long name of the book is the book of the Acts of the Apostles. But a better name for that given to this same book is the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. So everything that you see in the book of Acts is actually not what Paul is doing, not what Peter is doing, not what Silas is doing, not what James is doing, not what Stephen is doing. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing through these people. And this is very important to see. It's very important to understand, friends, because God is willing to use you. God wants to use you. He saved you. He saved you because He wants to use you. He has come to you, not, because, not only because He wants to save you, but also because He wants to save others through you. Are you aware of that reality, friends? And so the book of Acts is the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. In chapter 16, we, we find Paul going through his second journey, missionary journey. He's now covering other cities that will be not only uh, uh, visited by the apostles, but also these cities will be the, the, uh, uh, the places where the new churches, Christian churches, will be open. And everywhere Paul went, he conquered hearts of people for Jesus in opening a church. So what we are reading in chapter 16, or what we read in chapter 16, is the foundation of one of those churches, to be specific, the church of Philippi. Remember the, the, the letter to the Philipp Philippians? These are it. There are three members uh, that are mentioned, three people that are mentioned in this chapter, chapter 16 of the book of Acts. These three people are the first ones that were, that were uh, won by Apostle Paul to be the members, the founder members of this church, the church of Philippi. Number one, an, a woman by the name of Lydia, of the high class. Number two, uh, a woman who was demon possessed and was freed by the apostle. And number three, a man who was a jailer. These three people were the first ones that were um, won by, uh, for Jesus by the Apostle Paul to, that founded the church, the specific church that we all have read about. This, dear friends, is the context in which we read um, what is found in chapter 16. So the very first, the very first verse that we saw is the, the Apostle Paul and Silas, his companion, were thrown into prison. And you will say, why will be, they will be thrown, thrown into prison? And what happened there was that um, they came to this city. They came to this town that were led by the Holy Spirit. They came to the town and one of the th first things that they encountered was a woman that was a girl, actually, that was possessed by a demon. And she was chasing Paul and Silas everywhere they went. Remember that we're preaching the gospel. God brought them to this city to spread the gospel, the good news of salvation for, for all men. And when this woman was chasing these two, she was doing certain declarations that Paul got annoying, says the Bible about it. And he turns around and he says, Demon, in the name of Jesus, I command you to get out of that woman. And the Bible says that immediately in that moment, the demon left the woman and she was freed. She was free. But the problem was that this woman was a good asset. She was a good prophet. She would bring good prophets to her master. Because the master would use her to make money out of her. But the moment the demon left the woman, she was free. And there was not more profit out of what she was able to do because of the demon. So the owner, the master of this girl went and created rumors in the, world, in the, in the town uh, against Paul and Silas. The magistrates, the leaders of the town, decided, looking at them and seeing that they, were no, they didn't look like Romans, they didn't dress like Romans, they looked like Hebrews, they were accused as Hebrews, they decided to, throw it, to give it some whips and throw it into prison. Now listen, friends, listen. This word God sent... These were God's ambassadors. These were God's children. They were doing God's work. They were preaching on behalf of God. And when they were doing all this conquering for the kingdom of God, they are whipped. They are beaten. They are thrown into prison. 
I don't know you, about you, friends, but these things don't, don't, don't match, don't add up in my mind. When you do God's will, these awful things happen to you? What do you think about that, friends? It just doesn't add up in my mind. Something is not right in the, at this moment. And now you have to also consider that these tribes, when, when it was in the, in the Hebrew culture, there were a maximum of, of tribes that you can, you can uh, give, it, give to a prisoner. I think it was four. No more than four. Right? But in the Roman culture, you can give as many webs as you want. And people will get it and get it until they will pass out of the pain. And the ones whipping will be tired of just giving and giving and giving. So you can imagine Paul and Silas being just, just a mess. Their bodies a mess because of the whip. And on top of that, they are sent to a Roman uh, jail, a Roman prison, which was not a resort. It was the worst thing. They didn't have beds. They didn't have proper hygiene. It was the, uh, the most awful thing that you could experience. They were sent there, but the moment they were sent there, they were also given an instruction. Secure these guys, which means, and the reaction to the, uh, of the jailer was to put it in the inner cell, which means that they were put on the worst cell of the worst prison. Now again, Paul was called by Jesus himself. Paul was preaching the gospel on behalf of Jesus. Jesus told him to do that. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit said, this is the place you are to go. And Paul was obeying. And when he was obeying, when he was doing the right thing, when he was doing the, all the things that he was told to do, obeying, these things happen. Something doesn't add up. Something doesn't add up. How can you be in the right thing, thing, wrong things happen to you? Why would this happen? Why would this happen, friends? See, one thing that we have to learn, one thing that we have to learn from the beginning, I'm going to give it to you, friends, is that in the middle of God's, of one's pain, God will save someone. In the middle of one's pain, God will save someone. This is what the church needs to know. This is what every member of the body of Christ needs to know. Is that when, when God's people are allowed to come into a storm, it's because God has a plan. And the plan that, God's all, that God always has is, is always around the salvation of His people. Because there is nothing more important for God than saving you. It is so important it is so important, friends, so remarkably important that God sent His own Son to die for you because He wants to save you. God will save you. So Paul and Silas were doing the right thing, were obeying God, and they were thrown into prison. They were thrown into prison. Bad things happen to good people, friends. That's the reality. But when those wrong things happen to, to God's people, God has a plan. Remember that God has a plan always. So what happened? This is the perfect scenario. Right? Bleeding, stinking, crying, just in pain, suffering. Was the perfect scenario to say, to say God, if this is, this is going to be my life with you, I'm better off without you. Most of us will say, I'm okay. If this is what I'm going to receive because I'm following you, because I'm accepting you, because I'm, I'm obeying to you, I'm okay by myself. Most of people in the world will say this. And it's the perfect scenario to say it. But we want to learn. We need to learn from the apostle. Because in the middle of that suffering, instead of complaining against God, he decided to praise God. And in the, at midnight, it says the text, at midnight, which means that, of course, they couldn't sleep. They were awake. And to make matters worse, when you were sent into that jail, when you were sent into the inner cell, there was an instrument of, of torture that is described in the text as stock. You know what a stock was? It was a, a piece of wood that was adjustable, right? They would put the, the prisoner 
they will sit the prisoner there and put the legs of the prisoner on this wood and then will adjust it. They will adjust it to, to create more and more pain in the legs of the prisoners. They will stretch the legs so much until they were about to break. That was the stock. Friends, imagine. This man was in pain. This man was bleeding. This man was suffering. And in the middle of all that, when he could simply curse God, he decided to praise God instead. And at midnight, they started to pray. They started to pray. And not just pray, they started to sing. The text says that at midnight, they were praying and they were singing. And the rest of the prisoners were listening to them. They were praying and they were singing because pray is one of the most important tools of praising God. When you pray, you are praising God. And that's why we want to invite you to seven hours with Jesus. Please come join us so we can praise God through prayer. That's what seven hours with Jesus is all about. When you pray, you are praising God. But they were not only praying, they were not only praising God through prayer, they were also pray, praising God through songs. But I want to tell you something, friends, about these songs. These were not any songs. These were not the rep repetitive songs that we are used to today. That you, all that you say is one phrase you say for half an hour, and you keep on saying that phrase. No, 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 friends. This is a special song. These are special songs that are sung by the two of them and a special prayer, and both of them, prayer and, and songs, have a message. They had a message. How do we know that? Because everyone else in the jail, in the prison, un heard and understood what they were saying. There is a word that says there, they were listening to them. That word listening is the only time in the whole Bible that is found. One time. Just one time. It's a, it's a compound word made up of two Greek words. The first word is the word epi in, in Greek. That means in or out, on. In, on, or on. And the second word simply means it's translated into here. But I want you to know that the reason why I believe the, uh, the apostle or the, or the disciple Luke is writing in using this unique word is to tell you, friends, that when the prayers were going up and when the songs were going up, people were getting in, they were hearing and getting the words in, and they were also being covered by the words. Because the right prayer and because the right song, they have the potential to transform people. Because the right songs and the right prayers talk about the right God. And when people hear about the right God, they need to respond to the right invitation. So they sung, they prayed. Instead of cursing, they bless God. And see friends, this, this is a decision that we need to make. This is a decision we need to make. Even today, before a storm's coming, we know that storms will come. Before they come, we need to decide what are we going to do with the rough times come our way. Right? Everything might be going well for you today. Right? Everything is fine. Your, your family is fine. Everything has a job. You have money to pay your rent. Everything seems to be fine. But I, I'm here to tell you, friends, the reality is that even though your present might be fine and praise God for that, Sooner than later, a storm will come your way. And so before the, storms, the storm comes your way, you have to decide, what is it? What am I going to do when that happens? Am I going to curse God or am I going to bless God? You have to make that decision today. You have to make up your mind of the attitude you're going to have when you are in the middle of the storm. You still with me, friends? And so Paul, he knew. Regardless of the pain, regardless of the suffering, regardless of the tears, regardless of the, of the blood, he was praising God. He decided to praise God. That has been my decision, friends. I made that decision before I got into the mess that we are today. And you know, this, this is part of the series to be continued. So I have to bring again what's happening in my life. Because what's happening now is that we are going through 505 
days, 505 days of my wife still in that bed. And I don't know about you, friends. You might have gone through more painful situations than this, friends, but I never experienced this kind of pain. I never gone through this kind of suffering. This experience right here goes by far, putting all the events, uh, uh, delicate, uh, delicate and, uh, and, and suffering events of my past, putting all together doesn't match. All together, they don't match to what I'm going through right now, friends. But the only way why I'm still standing before you, friends, is by the grace of God and because He helped me to understand that I had to make up my mind before I go through the storm. So when the storm comes, I will know that though I'm bleeding, that though I'm crying, that though I'm in pain, I will praise the Lord. You have to do it today, friends. Don't wait. Because when pain is in your system, there is no way that you may be able to make the right decision. You have to do it when everything is going calm. That's the best time to make a decision for what, when that situation changes. 505 days. 505 days. I can bet you, I said this before, friends, but I can bet you when Vivian wakes up and she looks around and she sees what the Lord has been doing all this time, she will say, it was worth it. It was worth it. Because God is more interested in your salvation that in even being healed. But her healing will come to pass at the right time and for the right reason. And I'm gonna be there. I wanna be there to see what the Lord will do it. And I'm gonna stand here until the Lord decides to do, to bring, decides to bring about the miracle that he is planning, friends. But we need to learn to praise God. We need to learn to praise God not only in the happy moments, but also in the hard moments. We need to learn to praise God not only in the happy moments, but also in the hard moments. Life will bring rough waves your way, but we need to learn to praise God at all times. So I was mentioning that they were praising and they were praising God through music and they were praising God through prayer. And what was the result of that? What do you think happened after that? Right? I pray that my wife will be awakened. I pray that she will be raised, restored, completely restored. What do you think the result will be? Paul and Silas were praying. And an earthquake took place. As a, result, as a result of this prayer and praising of these two, an earthquake came up. And the earthquake, said reports, the, the reports look, the earthquake opened the doors and loosed the chains of the prisoners. Guess what would be the first thing that I would do if I were Paul? Guess. What would you do? You are in prison. You are in the worst shape. And suddenly uh, and you're praying and then an earthquake comes your way and things get loose and the, the way is clear for you to run out. What do you think it would be the first thing that I would do? Run out? Friends, I will be out in the middle of the earthquake. I will not even wait for the doors to come down. I will not even wait for the chains to come down. I will start running as soon as the earthquake starts. That's what I'm going to do. You know why? Because I will remember Peter. Peter was in prison and God sent an angel to get it out. So I would think, I would think the normal thing would say, would, would be to think, okay, so this is how God delivers his people. He will deliver me now. This earthquake was sent to deliver me. But you know what? Paul is much better than that. Because Paul had a had an intimate relationship with God. He knew what God wanted because Paul as all of us here were saved. What Paul was saved not only for his own sake, but also for the, the, the sake of all those that were around Paul. And this is something that we need to learn, friends. He didn't run when he saw all the options open. 
because he knew there was a purpose for this phenomenon that took place. And he stayed. He stayed. He stayed because he knew, friends, he knew, he knew that this was designed not only for his rescued, but it was designed for the rescued of those who were around and witnessing what was taking place. Paul didn't run. Paul stayed. He stayed. And the earthquake, so the earthquake shook the foundations of the prison. Friends, the foundations of the prisoners were shaken. And the foundations of the jailer were also shaken. Friends, when an earthquake comes to your life, it's, it's designed for you to be shaken, but not for you to, sh to be shaken to run away for your life, but for you to run away for their lives. I don't know if anyone is understanding here, friends, but when God allows a calamity to come to your life, most of the times it might not be just for you. It might be for those who are around you. And many times we are so asleep, so asleep that God needs to send an earthquake for us to wake up. And when that comes, you need to be sure you are at the right place, with the right attitude and with the right God. And if this is the case, if this is the case, you have nothing to fear because God is with you. So again, we need to understand that, that the earthquake is not for us to run for our lives. It is for us to run for their lives because God wants to save and since God wants to save, God will save. And you know how he's going to do it? God, God wants to use his children. God wants to use his children to save his children. And God brought Paul and Silas to this prison. Because he wanted to save those who were in prison. Because he wanted to save those who were around prison. Because God wants to use his children to save his children. So again, what is, what is that event that is going, out, going, going on in your life? What is that that is taking your, your breath away? That is taking your, your hours of rest away? What is that that doesn't allow you to sleep every night? What is that problem that you're dealing with? Could it just be? Church, could it just be that that plan, that, that problem, that, that suffering that you are experiencing right now has been designed in, he in heaven for you to wake up and realize there are people perishing around you without knowing about Jesus? Yeah. He sends this earthquake to call up your attention and to say to you, my daughter, to say to you, my son, I saved you because I wanted to save others through you. What are you doing? Why are you wasting your time? Why are you so concentrating on getting the things of the world when I want you to get this world for me? What are you doing? Wake up. And so the prisoners and the jailer, they were listening to the prayers and the songs. So much so when, when, when that when the prisoner woke up because of the earthquake, he runs and sees the, door, the doors open and he says, I'm done. The doors are open, the chains are on the, on the ground, I'm done. Because remember, those who were sent to prison, they were sent with a sentence, which was pretty much death. And so when the jailer comes out and sees everyone out, the Roman law was that if a, a prisoner will escape, a prisoner will escape, the jailer was to pay the penalty that was given to the prisoner. So when, sees, when he sees everyone gone, he says, I'm dead. Everyone is out. I'm dead. So instead of giving my flesh for them to do whatever they want with me, I'm going to take my own life. And save me some pain. So the reaction of the jailer is just because he knew that he was, he was dead. 
because he saw the door open, he saw the chains on the floor, on the ground, and he saw, and he thought, okay, I'm dead. So he gets the sword out and he's ready to kill himself. And just before he kills himself, he hears a voice that comes from the inner cell. Dude, don't kill yourself. We're right here. We're right here. So you can imagine, you can imagine the, the impression, the, the, the happiness of the jailer. He runs into the, the, uh, the inner cell with a light to see that in fact, everyone was there. Because Paul says, we are here, we are all here. Why is everyone there instead of running away? Because they heard the message. Because they heard these people pray, because they heard these people, these people praising God through music. When did they hear him? They heard them when they were in pain. Because when you praise God when you're in pain, it's a great testimony for people. So watch this, watch this, friends. People are looking at you how you react when bad things happen to you. They are checking you out. And if you simply react like everyone else, you have missed your opportunity to witness for the powerful name of Jesus. And they see you that you panic like everyone else. What's the benefit of being a Christian? Suffering will come to us as to everyone else. But the difference is that we are not alone. And since we are not alone, our reaction is different. Because there is somebody else that gives us peace. Because there is somebody else that gives us power in the middle of the storm. So your reaction when you are in suffering speaks tones. You can say anything with your mouth, with everything was fine. But when you are in pain and you still steady, blessing and praising God, this creates a big impact in the heart of those that are around you. Because God saved you, not only for your own sake, God saved you to save others. God wants to use God's children to save his other children. He wants to use you. Friend, he wants to use you. What are we doing? This guy, this guy uh, came in and just fell down. He didn't know what else to express, how else to express the condition of his heart. He comes there and he asks, what, what should I do to be saved? What should I do? What should I do? And the answer of the apostle is very simple, but at the same time concerning. Because the apostle says, the apostle says, believe, believe in Jesus Christ and you and your household will be saved. And Paul says this with, uh, with category because he's saying, he's being categorical because he knows that God will save. And so he says, all that you have to do is just believe and you are going to be saved and your household will be saved. Your family will be saved. God will be saved. God will save. And so, and so Paul, Paul's, uh, um, today people are debating about, upon this saying and saying, see, all that you have to do is just believe. There's nothing about changing. There's nothing about picking better the way you dress, the, the way you eat, uh, dropping this, picking up this. There's nothing about that. It just says believe. And we make that, that, uh, we make that critic simply because we don't understand that the word belief in the old test, in the old times is different than the one, the way we describe it today. Today, to believe is simply to accept a, a group of knowledge. Even a doctrine, a teaching, you accept it. That is to believe. You believe in that doctrine. But the word pisteo, which is the word in the Greek that, that is translated into into uh, to believe comes from the root word pistis and pistis means faith it means trust friends when they took, talked about to believe they were not just saying you are to hear about this and accept this thank you very much that's all that you need you know you study uh, all 28 fundamental beliefs and you're ready no what, they, what, what Paul was saying at this moment is that you are to believe in Jesus Christ. You are to trust in Jesus Christ. You are to depend in Jesus Christ. You are to love Jesus Christ. And when you depend, you do everything that God tells you. 
Everywhere you want to go, you will ask him first. And when you trust, you will do everything that he asks you to do. Because even though it sometimes it might not even make sense, God knows what he's doing and you know that he knows what, you, what he's doing and you trust. But you love him. To believe is to love him. And that simply means, friends, that you do anything and everything to please the one you love. That is to believe. It's not just to know what the 2300 days are about. It's not just to know where to find the doctrine of the Sabbath or the doctrine of the state of the dead. It goes beyond knowledge. To believe is to trust, to depend, and to love. And so when Paul was asking this or, or telling this to the jailer, the jailer understood what Paul was meaning. So much so that you see in his action that he is a transformed man. The jailer is a transformed man. You want to be, ref you want to see reformation? This is a reformed man. Because the first thing that he does, even though he was in jail, he was, even though he was sent by the magistrates to send it to the worst cell that he had, he gets the prisoners out and he starts washing the prisoner and feeding the prisoners. He's transformed, but not just that. We know he's transformed because the first thing that he wanted to do is come tell this to my family preach to my family so what the jailer is doing is introducing his family to Jesus because that's what a converted one does that's what a, a born again Christian does because when you have met God when you have met Jesus you want everyone to know about this Savior everyone if you're ashamed if you're shy if you hide it you might not be a Christian Every Christian that is born into the, in, into the kingdom of heaven is born as a missionary. Your DNA now is a missionary. Wherever you go, you tell about Jesus because that's the one that you are in love with. It comes natural to you because you have experienced, you have experienced salvation and you want others to experience salvation because you have understood that God saved you not only for your own sake, God saved you because he wants to save others through you. Because you understand that God will save. God will save. So what, what Paul is saying is not that because you believe everyone is saved in your home. Because, the, because Sway believes that doesn't mean that Natalie and everyone else in their home will be saved. No, no, no. It means that because Sway is converted, he will bring the gospel to everyone else. And they at their proper time will accept it too. And everyone will be saved. So Paul is not making, making a promise. Paul is giving a prophecy. Paul is not making a prophecy by saying you and your host how will be saved. He is giving a prophecy that this is going to take place because a parent that is transformed, a parent that is converted, a parent that has received the Holy Spirit, a parent that has accepted Jesus Christ will want to guide their children on the same way he's walking on. Because God wants to save his children through his children. Through his children. Friends, if you accept God's salvation and live like a saved one, raising your kids in the fear of the Lord, by example, not only by word, God will save your family. It is his promise. Just like the way the jailer's family was saved. The day that the earthquake shook, not only the building was shook. The day that the, the, from the, the building was shook, the jail was shook, the prison was shook, not only this building was shaken, the life of this family was also shaken. And the moment this took place, friends, they never came to be the same. Never again. These people were converted to the gospel. They were dedicated to the gospel. They were committed to the gospel. 
And there was nothing more important than the gospel to them. Friends, we need to learn. We need to learn now, now, before suffering comes to our life. We need to learn now that in the middle of one's pain, God will save someone. It's God's promise. We need to learn. We need to learn that, that, that when, when we praise God, since we praise God in the happiness, in the happy moments, we need to also learn to praise God in the hard time, in the hard moments. Friends, we need to decide today, right now, right at this moment, because a storm is coming, because an earthquake is coming, and you know, you know, many people are looking for the earthquake, many people are looking for the signs, so they can run away for their lives. They can lie, run away to save themselves. But what if the earthquake, what, what if all these natural phenomena are sent to you, not for you to find shelter, but for you to bring the shelter to people that don't know about the shelter? So why don't we stop thinking about ourselves? And I start thinking about those who God has sent you to be utilized by His Holy Spirit to save. So here is my commitment and, hope, and I hope that this will be yours too. I want to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, because I know He wants to save others, because I know He wants to save me, because I know He wants to save you and yours through you. So friends, I don't know if this message was for you. I don't know who's this, who did, whom this message was for. And you might say, I'm, I'm too young for this. I'm just beginning this life. I have so much to enjoy. It's not time for me. Maybe later. Because our custom as human beings is to let, live it for later. And we, we turn to be 70, 80. Then is when we say, I'm going to come back. My friends, why, why wasting our lives out there? Why wasting our youth out there? And when we are consumed, we come back to wanting to serve God when there is nothing, no, no energy, no youth, no, nothing to offer. Why not doing it today when we can move? Why not doing it today when we can actually contribute to the spreading of the gospel? Why not today? So I want to invite you, young, young people, younger people. I want to invite you to commit to the Lord. You know why? Because there is nothing better than serving Jesus Christ. Because when He is in your hearts, when He is in your hearts, Friends, when Jesus is in your heart, He works through your heart and He shows to everyone. And when you stand up through the storm, God stands next to you and calls His children through His children. Friends, God will save. Be part of that.